Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, for uh, today, the new feature will be, I will not uh, only consider static manifolds, but I will deform the manifolds, or more precisely, I'm going to deform the metric. So the situation will be the following. I take a fixed manifold, but instead of taking a, a given metric, I look at the family of metrics. And I will be some interval in R uh, plus, usually from zero to capital T or something like that. And what will this family GT be? So these are Riemannian metrics. And they evolve following some kind of uh, uh, geometric flow, for instance. So this is, a, this is usually a C1 family of Riemannian metrics. The evolution is completely deterministic, yeah? and uh, as I already uh, uh, can see here, the most uh, eminent example is uh, the so-called Ricci flow, which has been introduced by uh, Richard Hamilton. And what is the idea behind that? Uh, well, the idea is, uh, of course, on any manifold, uh, you can choose a Riemannian metric. But there is no canonical way how to do this. Yeah? And so you may ask, what is a good metric for a given uh, manifold, uh, which should reflect uh, the topology uh, of the manifold in a proper way? And the idea is, well, uh, let the manifold decide itself what is a good metric. So first, put any metric uh, on uh, M, and then try to make this uh, metric to look better, yeah? to improve the metric, to make uh, the manifold more round, and uh, so on. And uh, the idea uh, is the following. Uh, you uh, deform the metric by this uh, so-called Ricci flow equation. Yes, so there are a lot of things to explain. Uh, on, the right, on the left hand side, well, you have the metric, the derivative uh, with respect to time. So this is a two tensor. On the right hand side, I have minus two Ricci uh, uh, with respect to the metric GT. This is also a two tensor. And the initial condition is my given metric I start with. Yeah? Now you may ask why this equation, why two here, why minus, uh, and so on. Yeah? And I'm coming to this uh, uh, immediately. The idea behind this equation is, in some sense, Ricci flow should be seen as a heat equation but on the space of Riemannian metrics. Yeah. So uh, what, what does that mean? Uh, I'm not going to make this uh, completely precise, but just uh, to uh, show you an indication for that. Uh, on a Riemannian metric, locally you can uh, consider harmonic coordinates. Yeah. So uh, in, a local, in a local chart, which is harmonic, you develop Ricci, so the IJ component uh, of uh, Ricci in this uh, chart. And you will see uh, you get an expansion which uh, starts minus one half Laplacian, but the Laplacian applied to the, G, to the IG component of the metric plus lower order terms, so terms involving only first derivatives and so on. 
If you go with this information uh, to the uh, uh, Ricci flow equation, you see on the right hand side, well, we have here two. This goes away by the one half. Yeah? So, and we have minus, and here we have minus. So we get plus over here, plus Laplacian of Gij, plus some lower order terms. Yeah? So one should not think uh, uh, the right hand side as kind of Laplacian on the Riemannian matrix in the sense uh, that the Riemannian matrix is a section of the bilinear forms and so on, because if you work with Levi Civita, then the Laplacian would be zero. Yeah? But uh, it gives you some indication how uh, this uh, uh, equation uh, should, uh, should work. And uh, the idea is the following. Well, you have uh, this initial metric, which may be quite uh, complicated. And uh, then heat flow means you try to, to smoothen it out. Yeah? Like you are, let's suppose, you are in the Himalaya and you are confused by the very bizarre uh, environment. And what would you do is uh, you uh, could try to heat up the Himalaya. Yeah? Then the ice will melt down yeah? and the landscape will be more smooth. Yeah? If you wait long enough, maybe global warming is doing the job for you. But uh, the idea is uh, then, if you let this equation run, you will get a nicer and nicer uh, metric. And maybe as t goes to infinity, if this equation can be solved, you may see uh, some very canonical metric on the space. Yeah? Of course, there is some price uh, to pay. This is a highly nonlinear uh, evolution, and usually you will have singularities uh, in finite times. Yeah? So if you think about the ice melting down, it can happen that at some point uh, part of the mountain is just collapsing. Yeah? And uh, so the, the difficulty is to understand uh, such singularities, how they build up, uh, how uh, they can be characterized, and in particular how to get control on such things. Well, to give you a first idea, uh, if uh, you follow this equation, uh, then, uh, of course, uh, Ricci uh, evolves because GT uh, evolves. And you may look at the scalar curvature, which you just get by tracing uh, Ricci. Yes? And you look at what equation the scalar curvature is following then you see a typical reaction diffusion equation. So on the right-hand side, you have two parts. Yes? Uh, here is uh, Laplacian of R. R is the scalar curvature. So if you ignore the second term, this would be a standard heat equation. Yeah? So if you are on a compact manifold and you would not have the second term, it would, uh, the evolution would for the scalar curvature would just be uh, that scalar curvature is equally distributed out over the manifold. So the flow would uh, uniformly distribute uh, the curvature. The second term here has an opposite effect. It tries to concentrate uh, curvature. And so you have here a competing, uh, uh, competing uh, 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 things. One is smoothening out and one is concentrating. And you have to look which of the two tendencies uh, will beat the other yeah, to understand this equation. Okay, uh, well, uh, I should say uh, this is one example for such a family of uh, metrics. Of course, uh, uh, we uh, could look at other ones, a canonical way of deforming 
a matrix is given by mean curvature of flow. Yeah? So you embed your manifold as some uh, uh, sub-manifold into Rn, and then you look at mean curvature flow and you pull back uh, the induced metric from Rn to your manifold, and you get the family of uh, uh, metrics, and that's what we call an evolving manifold. And of course, there are many other things, uh, but mainly I will stick to the case uh, of uh, Ricci flow. There are actually two kinds uh, of uh, Ricci flow equation. The one I introduced was with the minus here. This, as we have seen, uh, gives us heat equation because uh, if you look here, the minus minus goes away. The other one is with a plus sign, which is a backward heat equation. And both are equally uh, uh, important uh, to understand, and both equations give you a deformation of the metric. Well, now, uh, if you remember what we did uh, yesterday, I, in this crash course, I tried to explain what is uh, uh, flow to a second order differential operator, and in particular, we constructed flow to the Laplace Beltrami uh, operator. And the defining equation was uh, this here. I wrote it here in differential uh, notation. And for a Brownian motion on a static manifold, we said, well, it should be the stochastic flow to the uh, given uh, Laplace Beldrami operator. Here we have uh, lots of uh, Laplacians, because for each t we have uh, another one. And so it's natural at time t which uh, Laplacian should we take, while well, the one we have at time t. Yeah? So this is uh, the uh, Laplace Beltrami with respect to the metric gt. Yeah? And so this is some uh, natural thing to uh, consider, and uh, such a flow corresponding to this evolving family of uh, uh, Laplacians I will call a GT Brownian motion on M, okay? Well, uh, to give you a, a, a rough idea how to think about uh, this uh, object, uh, now uh, I should, uh, uh, this is my notation. I start at time S at the point small x, and this is the position where I'm at time t. This is no longer homogeneous, yeah? so, uh, uh, because uh, the operator depends explicitly uh, on t. I cannot just shift uh, time. Uh, I really get uh, or should look at, or say as I start at zero and run up to time t, but this is not the same as starting at s and run up to time s plus uh, t. Well, of course, uh, this is still an elliptic diffusion, so I will have uh, nice uh, transition kernels, and they have a density. So I look at the probability uh, starting at x at time uh, small s uh, of the position at time t, x uh, t, to be in some... Uh, uh, given set. This is a measure which has a density, but I have to decide density with respect to which reference measure. Well, because uh, usually the reference measure you take is the Lebesgue measure induced uh, by the metric, but now we have lots of metrics. Yeah? So at time t, here I'm at time t and looking at the position at time t, so it's natural to take as reference measure the measure I have at time t, so the one corresponding to the metric gt. Right? And, uh, well, then we get a nice uh, kernel here, and we can look at the corresponding 
uh, evolution uh, or the corresponding heat equation, you see uh, what you get looks quite familiar. What you expect, you have a, so the time derivative of this kernel equals the Laplacian, but now depending on time. But you have a new term here, yeah, which is uh, given as derivative of the metric trace uh, of uh, that. And uh, so if you uh, uh, take the special case that uh, GT is given uh, by the Ricci flow, uh, G dot would be plus minus Ricci, so a trace of Ricci is scalar curvature, and so you get the following evolutions. Uh, uh, for the forward Ricci flow, the heat equation is, well, as you would uh, expect, uh, here I just uh, let the Laplacian depend on T, but I get a new term here, yeah, which is scalar curvature multiplied by PT. And I have plus or minus depending on whether I'm looking at the forward Ricci flow or the backward Ricci flow. Yes. So this is already an equation which is no longer so, so easy uh, uh, to handle, but I'm uh, coming back uh, to this. Uh, so uh, what one could do now is, uh, well, natural question is, uh, there is... Uh, uh, has been over decades, a lot of works uh, done to understand heat equation on uh, uh, Riemannian manifold, how it depends on geometry and so on. So a natural question would be now look at the heat equation, yeah, but under, for instance, under the Ricci flow. Yeah? So you let uh, the metric evolve according uh, to uh, uh, Ricci flow, forward Ricci flow, and uh, uh, study the heat equation in this situation. Well, this is a typical forward uh, heat equation. Uh, there is a lot of interest also in the so-called conjugate heat equation. Uh, I take uh, as well uh, um, a forward Ricci flow here, but now I look at uh, time derivative of u uh, uh, plus the Laplacian. So I would, if I put it on the other side, I would have minus. This is a backward heat uh, equation. And, uh, well, so uh, the question would be uh, what can we say about such system, but uh, I want to explain first why this is interesting. And actually, this is one of the crucial steps in Perelman's uh, work to understand, for instance, this conjugate heat equation. Well, let me uh, give you a very uh, brief uh, introduction to the basic uh, uh, setting of this theory. Uh, if you uh, want to uh, study Ricci flow, and uh, I remember having heard lots of talks already quite some time ago, and what the people always said, why is Ricci flow so difficult? Because it's not a gradient flow. Yes. And uh, this you could hear for, uh, for quite a long time. Yeah? And it's uh, true, but it's not completely true. Yeah? And the new uh, idea really came from Perelman in this direction. What he uh, uh, did is look at the following functional. This is not a functional just so we have a, a, a given manifold, and we look at all the Riemannian metrics on this manifold. Yeah? And I define a functional uh, which assigns some value well, to a metric, but not just to a metric, 
metric times functions. So my functional is defined on the space of metrics of M and functions on M and uh, gives me a value in R. Yeah? And what uh, uh, or how is this uh, functional uh, defined? Well, you look here at gradient F uh, norm squared. So be aware, what does uh, it uh, mean? The gradient depends on the metric. You take the metric you have here. Norm squared also depends on the metric. So uh, the metric is uh, Then you add here scalar curvature with respect to uh, the uh, uh, metric uh, G, multiplied by e to the minus f, yeah, and integrated over the manifold. Yeah. In uh, this theory, usually m is compact. Yeah. Then you definitely have no trouble with uh, uh, defining uh, this uh, functional. And one should say, uh, if you look at uh, this work, usually there is always the assumption that M is uh, compact uh, because you want to use freely integration by parts. And as soon as you go away from having compact, you run in a lot of troubles. Yeah? And what I'm going to do is uh, later on, I will show you that my computations are no longer in terms of integration by parts. I will do everything by Ito's formula. And there I don't really need uh, that the manifold is compact. All I need is that certain local martingales at the end are true martingales because I want to take expectation and I do not want the expectation depend uh, on a time uh, t. Well, uh, you may say, okay, nice, so we can define uh, this uh, functional, but the point is now, well, uh, uh, what is a great, the gradient flow to this functional f? Or in more uh, naive terms, you uh, may ask how to deform the metric and how to deform this function f to get the most of increase or decrease of your functional. Yes? Uh, well, uh, this is uh, quite a general uh, problem. So one... Uh, uh, first assumption is you have here the volume measure but weighted by e to the minus f. And you should insist that this product here gives you a static measure. So the volume depends on t if you deform the metric and f will also uh, deform. And, but this measure uh, should uh, be a, a static measure. And then you realize the following. Well, uh, the, uh, you should deform the metric following this equation, which looks quite similar to what we had before, except that here is now a Hessian of f. Yeah? But people uh, uh, having some background in probability theory, you know this is uh, Ricci plus Hessian of f. This is uh, the Bakri Emery Ricci uh, tensor, or the, the um, Toulousian uh, uh, Ricci uh, uh, curvature. So that uh, should not... Uh, uh, disturb us uh, too much. Uh, F should follow not a heat equation but a backward heat equation. And here is still this uh, 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 scalar curvature. And uh, so the, the upshot, or what I want to tell is I'm not explaining now in which sense this is exactly the gradient flow, but uh, take the reversed point of view. Uh, suppose that G and F evolve according these two equations here, and then look what happens to your F functional. Yeah? 
So, uh, well, uh, calculate the f functional and look at its time derivative. Then you uh, calculate things and uh, you see uh, this uh, term here on the right hand side. And what is the interesting thing? The interesting thing is here you have something norm squared e to the minus f. So this is positive. Yeah. So the, along the flow, or if we uh, deform g and f using these uh, two equations, our f functional will be monotone. Yes, and this, if you uh, are uh, familiar with uh, the theory of geometric flows, this is always some uh, very powerful uh, result. If you find a functional which behaves monotone along the flow, then you are always uh, in a good position to get information out of this. And so here, uh, the Perelman f functional uh, behaves uh, uh, monotone uh, along uh, the flow. And, uh, well, there is this annoying point that this is not just uh, exactly Ricci flow, what we would like uh, to have, because there is this Hessian. But there is a well-known uh, trick how to get rid of uh, this, uh, which is uh, the following. Uh, take the time-dependent vector field which is the gradient of f. Yes? So this is a vector field, and it generates a flow, phi t. And now you pull back the metric using this flow, and at the same time, you pull back the function using uh, this flow. Then you get two new families, uh, uh, g star of t and f star uh, of uh, t. And uh, if you look then at the evolution of uh, uh, these uh, pulled back quantities, you see the metric now uh, evolves exactly following Ricci flow equation. Here we still have uh, a backward heat equation. We get one new term, but for the moment we should not worry uh, about it. And of course, it's trivial to check that under simultaneous pullback of metric and functions, the uh, f functional does not change. Yeah, so this does not affect uh, the value of the f functional. In particular, we have the same monotonicity uh, as uh, we had uh, before. So up to now, we have the following information. If uh, G evolves uh, under Ricci flow and F under this uh, uh, bit strange uh, backward uh, heat equation, then the F functional is monotonic. Yeah. And even more, you see, uh, well, this is an integral over Ricci plus Hessian of F norm squared. Yeah. And uh, we see that uh, uh, monotonicity is even strict, well, unless this term here, Ricci plus Hessian of f, is zero. Yeah? And what does it mean, Ricci plus Hessian of f being zero? This means uh, we are on a steady Ricci soliton. Yeah, which is a generalization of Einstein manifolds. If f would be zero, then you know Ricci being zero gives you an Einstein manifold. And more generally, Ricci plus Hessian of some function being zero. These uh, things are called Ricci solitons. Yeah? And we see uh, our monotonicity is really strict, yes? unless our flow uh, gets trapped by uh, such a Ricci uh, soliton. Yeah? And uh, so one of the major uh, steps was then to understand uh, Ricci solitons. In what can we say uh, about uh, such uh, things? Yeah? Well, finally, uh, to uh, relate it a bit more to uh, probability, instead of f, I will pass to u, which is e to the minus uh, f. And then uh, 
uh, uh, the G is still Ricci, following Ricci flow, and U is a standard backward heat equation, and on the right-hand side, I have just multiplication with scalar curvature. Yeah? So this will be, you see, this is exactly the equation I said at the beginning, uh, study heat equation under conjugate, uh, or study the evolution uh, um, of uh, conjugate heat equation. And so we have uh, now in terms of uh, U, the uh, uh, functional F writes like that, and the derivative is monotonic unless, and strict, uh, monotonicity is strict unless uh, this here is zero. Well, there's always some uh, thing people talk about entropy in this relation. So where is the entropy here uh, coming uh, up? Actually, it's not directly written out in Perelman's uh, uh, work, but uh, uh, it's a, a quite easy uh, calculation and a nice observation. So do the following. You have this U, which is a solution of the backward heat equation, which is pos a positive solution of the backward heat equation. Take this as a density for a measure, for a measure mu t, yes? And look at the entropy of this measure, yeah? So what does that mean? Well, you uh, look at the Boltzmann-Shannon entropy of this measure, so you can just define it. Well, I take here not minus, but plus, uh, so I get too many uh, minus uh, signs. So uh, take u log u, yeah, and integrate it with respect to the volume measure. And, Uh, here, here, here we are. Here we are. This is you. Yeah. Uh, which one you? Uh. No, uh, e to the minus uh, the corresponding volume. Yeah. Yeah. No, uh, yeah, e to the minus f volume measure at time t. Yeah? That should uh, be a, a static measure. Yeah? But here I'm not, uh, I'm, uh, so that means uh, 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 that, uh, uh, well, so here, uh, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, this here actually stays constant along the flow, which is a consequence of my hypothesis. Yeah? And basically, this uh, is uh, the same as to, uh, to say that this follows a backward heat equation. Yeah, so if you have uh, this equ uh, equation, this will be trivial. Uh, e to the minus f volume of t. Now that this should be a, a static measure, yeah. So just think about it. The, the total mass of this measure should, yeah, yeah. For instance, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. Okay, thanks, sir. Uh, so uh, look now at the entropy of this measure here, yeah. And, uh, uh, of course, what I said, if you would not have u log u, if you just take u there, it uh, would not depend uh, on t. Yeah? And uh, so this uh, depends on t, and uh, try to understand uh, the behavior of uh, t. And you see some very amazing fact. If you take the derivative of this entropy, what you find is exactly Perelman's f-functional. Yeah? So, 
In other words, we can uh, start uh, with uh, this uh, solution to the backward uh, heat equation under Ricci flow, look at its entropy, yeah? take the first derivative of the entropy, get the uh, Perelman's f functional, and the derivative of f which is now the second derivative of the entropy, is monotone. So you have some uh, convexity of the entropy function. Right? Okay, uh, so this uh, already introduces uh, the third item of my title, uh, which is related to entropy. Yeah, to uh, basically all my entropies I uh, will look at are somehow or correspond to measures which have, uh, where I have some reference measure and the density which is given as, solu as a positive solution of some heat equation. Okay, I still have 10 minutes, I think. Okay, now coming uh, back uh, to uh, stochastic analysis, uh, to uh, what uh, we uh, did yesterday. Uh, I showed you how to uh, 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 define uh, Brownian uh, motion. Now you will say everything just depends on T. Yeah? So you have a metric depending on T. So do things as we did yesterday, but let all uh, things depend uh, on T. And uh, you, uh, maybe if you are happy, you get uh, uh, the right uh, GT uh, Brownian motion. There is one major difficulty, because if you remember yesterday, we not just constructed Brownian motion, we constructed as well parallel transport along Brownian motion. Yeah? And if we would just do things as we did yesterday, letting the quantities depend on T, we would lose that the parallel transport uh, gives you isometries. This would no longer be true because the metric changes and there is some derivative of the metric which uh, must uh, come in. Yeah? So let me uh, briefly uh, explain the new idea. Instead of the tangent bundle of M, we consider the tangent bundle not over M but over space-time. So M times uh, this interval uh, in uh, R. Uh, so sections of uh, this bundle are now just time-dependent vector fields. Yeah? And uh, to do the same uh, thing as yesterday, well, where we had uh, on a Riemannian manifold the levi civita connection, we have to give this bundle a connection. Well, of course, if uh, we uh, just look at things in the space variable, if x, so sections of the bundle, are time-dependent vector fields, then uh, the covariant derivative of y in the direction of x, well, take uh, the usual covariant derivative you have at the time t. But there is one new thing. Uh, we also have now on m the time direction. And we have to explain what is the covariant derivative of a, a time-dependent vector field in the time direction. Yes? And uh, the, uh, there is only one reasonable way to uh, do this, which is given by the formula here. You take the usual derivative, and here you have one term where the derivative of the metric comes in. And it turns out that this connection is compatible with the metric. I think I saw this definition in a paper by Hamilton a long time ago, and you can check. This is basically the only way to get 
uh, a connection on uh, the tangent bundle over space-time, which is metric. Yeah? Okay, uh, so now uh, this connection allows uh, to define parallel transport, but uh, along uh, curves uh, in uh, space-time. So here you have a uh, curve in space-time also has an explicit uh, uh, time uh, component. And uh, I will look here at typically at curves x, t, uh, rho, t, where rho, t is uh, some monotone transformation of t, and uh, I'm only interested, at least here, in two cases where rho t is t, yeah? so where uh, I just have as additional component t here, or where time runs backward. From some capital T, uh, I look at capital T minus uh, t. Then I do exactly the same as uh, yesterday. I go to the frame uh, bundle. Now the fiber of uh, my frame bundle are now isometries, but uh, uh, between Rn and uh, the tension space at point X with respect to the metric uh, Gt. This uh, gives me again this decomposition in horizontal and vertical. And the summary is more or less here. We have a notion of horizontal lift. We can lift tangent vectors uh, downstairs, so on my uh, space time, up to tangent vectors uh, on the frame bundle. A typical vector, a tangent vector downstairs, well, is uh, something which is a tangent vector plus a, a time derivative. This is the additional uh, uh, ingredient, and we can horizontally lift it up uh, to uh, uh, some, we just lift up this uh, uh, tangent vector, and we have the horizontal lift of time derivative. If you work this out, what is the capital DT, you will see there is a derivative of the metric uh, in uh, it. Uh, but uh, for the moment, uh, we don't have uh, to worry about it. In terms of uh, the horizontal uh, vector fields, we have again this uh, uh, horizontal Laplacian uh, on the frames. And uh, Okay, one last uh, notation. Uh, take uh, so dt was the horizontal lift of the time derivative uh, uh, down uh, on the space time manifold, and I look at this vector field uh, uh, dt, but multiplied by rho dot of t. In our case, a rho a dot is just one or minus one. Yeah. And now, I'm, uh, as yesterday, I solved uh, this uh, uh, equation here on the frame bundle, but I introduced a new term which uh, uh, is constituted by this additional vector field on the frame bundle, which is the horizontal lift of time uh, 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 derivative. So this uh, gives me uh, a process on U. I start with something on Rn, on flat space, for instance, with Brownian motion, and I solve uh, this uh, equation. I get uh, a process U. I project it down, yeah, but the projection is over space-time, so I get a process on the manifold and my original rho t, so either t or capital T minus uh, T. And uh, the summary is uh, the following. Uh, if we start uh, with a Brownian uh, or Wiener process uh, on Rn, we do this uh, procedure, we get uh, uh, Brownian motion uh, on uh, uh, M. Yeah, but it's evolving, well, you have to be careful. I, at the beginning, I said GT Brownian motion, 
but what GT is uh, depends on the rho T. Yeah? So the metric you experience at time T will be the metric G rho T. Yeah? So it can be GT or also G capital T minus T if uh, time is uh, running uh, backwards. And uh, in the same way as yesterday, we have parallel transport, but uh, the nice thing is now, by construction, these parallel transports are isometries. Yeah? And uh, of course, uh, if you would uh, do the calculation a bit down to earth, you would have to elaborate uh, this uh, term here. Yeah? And then you would see you need a, an additional term which involves derivative of the metric and so on to achieve uh, that uh, uh, parallel transport finally uh, are isometries. Okay, so uh, I have uh, now uh, two uh, cases, x, t, t, or x t capital T minus T. If Z is Brownian motion, this gives me Brownian motion on my uh, space time. Okay, let me just use uh, the last minus two minutes uh, uh, to give you a first, uh, first example. So uh, look at uh, the heat equation but uh, the Laplacian should follow uh, some uh, flow uh, uh, where the uh, well, general uh, deformation uh, of the metric. Then you uh, work out uh, these uh, two formulas. You calculate the drift of u log u and of grad u norm squared over u. This is basically uh, Bochner's formula. Then you see here, here is hash and norm squared plus this term here, which is twice Ricci plus time derivative of t. So if you know that uh, dg over dt is greater or equal than minus 2 Ricci, which means that we have a super solution to the Ricci flow, this here is non-negative. Yeah? So you have on the right-hand side a uh, positive uh, drift. Uh. From that, it's quite easy to check that a combination of grad u norm squared over u and u log u, if time runs backward, gives you a sub-martingale. So a sub-martingale is a martingale plus something monotonically uh, increasing. And uh, if uh, under some integrability conditions or if it's a true sub-martingale, so boundedness or something like that, we can take expectations and compare the expectation at time zero to the expectation at time capital T. At time capital uh, T, you see I have written here capital T uh, minus uh, T. So uh, at the right end point, this term uh, goes away. On the left end point, if uh, small t is zero, I have here x zero, which is just a small x uh, t. So I end up with uh, this formula. And if I work it out, what this formula means, I get uh, a so-called gradient entropy estimate. I can estimate uh, grad u over u norm squared yeah, by the entropy here. Yeah? And you already, this is just the translation of uh, this uh, thing here. And you see already if uh, you, uh, this is entropy where this u is normalized, u uh, t, uh, x uh, t is just a constant, it does not affect the expectation. If you put the 1 over t on the other side, uh, you uh, see that the entropy is greater or equal than t times this uh, equation. It already gives you a growth rate for the entropy. So the entropy has to grow at a certain uh, rate. You can play around a bit with uh, this equation. You can introduce uh, some uh, uh, delta, or if uh, you 
uh, like uh, you can look at the maximum of u or a supremum uh, on m uh, and the time interval, you, uh, uh, so then it's less or equal, you take here the maximum, it's mt over utx log, then only this thing here depends on random, but the expectation is one. Yeah? So you immediately recover from the simple sub-Martingale argument, Hamilton's gradient estimate for grad u over uh, u in terms of uh, the maximum of u. Okay, thank you very much. I think thank it's you. time for lunch.